Hello, my name is Rocco Strangio. I'm the host of the Law, AI, and Money podcast. I bring on attorneys, engineers, and entrepreneurs to unravel the world of AI and to discuss it'll affect the legal profession. Today, I am joined with Carol Wall, an attorney and partner at the law firm of Zoll and Kranz. After graduating from the University of Michigan School of Law in 2012, Kara joined Zollenkrantz to work in their mass tort department. Her work focuses primarily on nursing home negligence, defective devices and drugs, and medical malpractice. Kara has extensive experience as a mass tort attorney and has since worked on numerous mass torts, ranging from Depuy ASR to an executive committee appointment in the Exactec MDL. In our conversation, Kara and I discuss the evolution of mass torts, the role of AI for attorneys, and the need to be tech forward in the ever-changing legal space. We hope you enjoy our conversation. Hey, Kara, how are you doing? Good. How's it going, Rocco? It's going great. You know, I, I I'm very happy you took the time to to come on. Yeah. As a prominent attorney in the mass tort space, and as someone who I think will lead the mass tort space in years to come, um, it's always helpful to have you on. And and you know, compared to a lot of attorneys in the space, you're probably the most tech forward person I know. So. Well, thank I you. Really appreciate. Yeah, I appreciate those kind of words. <laughs> I mean, they're deserving. When they're deserving, I, I I say it. So, I just want to start off, Kara, really quickly. You know how we got here. What made you become not just a litigator but a mass tort litigator? Yeah, so I'm actually a first gen lawyer, um, first in my family. And when I graduated undergrad, I said I should probably work in the space before I decide I want to go to law school. So I went to New York, and I was actually a paralegal in the mass tort space at the firm uh, was K. Scholler. It's now part of Arnold and Porter. Um, and my introduction to mass torts was as a paralegal in the HRT litigation, which is uh, the hormone replacement therapy litigation. Uh, and I learned then, A, that I wanted to do what the lawyers were doing, not just what the paralegals were doing. B, I learned that I loved the science. So I've always been something of a science nerd, even though I pursued more li the liberal arts side for my formal training. Yeah. Um, and, and so I love the science and the nitty gritty, getting into the regulations and the rules and the mechanisms of action. All of that excited me. But even more importantly, I learned I could not be on the defense side. Um, it was kind of hard to look myself in the mirror. We did a number of bellwether trials when I was working there. And the way that the internal dialogue shaped around the plaintiffs and their injuries just didn't sit well with me. Um, and so I knew that this area had caught in my heart, but that I couldn't do that side. And I will, I'm ashamed to say that being a plaintiff's master attorney did not even occur to me until I was graduating law school. Um, I think one of the the really sad things about the way our law school system is set up, um, and so I went to Michigan for law school, and your tracks were you were going to go big law, you were going to go clerk, or maybe if you were a bleeding heart person um, and you didn't want to do government work, you would do public interest. So I thought, well, the only place for me was public interest. Uh, and it wasn't until my last month of school, Zolan Kranz posted an ad with a career office um, so Toledo is about 45 minutes from Ann Arbor. And I had actually done my two all summer in Toledo. I was familiar with it. So Michelle had needed someone for the Depew ASR litigation. Um, I was apparently one of 50 people who applied for the job, but I had the background and kind of the rest is history. And um, so now I try to talk to students as much as possible about being a plaintiff's mass tort attorney, that you get the intellectual rigor and challenge um, while also knowing that you are helping people who really need that from you and that you're going up against these corporations that are about profit, not the individuals they should be serving. Yeah. I, I find it so interesting how many prominent attorneys started out as paralegals. And I feel like that's a great route. It is. And I know. So I, um, I, I, I've had people on the podcast who have gone through that route as well. And, you know, it's not uncommon to your other master attorneys. Yeah. What? I think I am a better lawyer for having been a paralegal first um, in terms of both how organized I am. Um, and I think my staff is, is, I am a little bit more realistic about what it takes to get things done having lived that life. Yeah, um, but it brings different angles um, to how I look at things. And so I am, you know, it made me a little bit older than some of my classmates at that time, but I'm 
mm-hmm. infinitely glad for the experience. And I think it make me better at the job. Yeah. Yeah. It was an investment. Yeah. I, I want to ask you, how has Mass Torts progressed since you started at Zolan? Oh, it's been a big change. Um, you know, so the first litigation here was Depew ASR, which was a pretty successful um, hip litigation. Um, and at that point in time, it was, I still think of that as kind of the first phase of mass torts, um, where we obviously had the logistical pieces like clean of fact sheets. Um, there would be some deficiencies, but it, there was much more of an emphasis on the global picture. Um, and as time has progressed, um, I, I really look at the tax and tier litigation as one of the first ones that went down this path of delving into more of the individual nature of each of the mass tort claimants, where it wasn't good enough for the bellwethers to get the really detailed work up. But now you're having to pull social media for all plaintiffs if they filed. There, the PFSs went from being you know a 15 page thing to 60 to 80 pages, um, and then having very detailed show cause and deficiency processes um, to weed out from the defense side. Um, weed out plaintiff's cases that can't meet these technicalities. Um, none of that happened in, in my early days. And we're seeing that playbook be picked up by other defense firms in the mass tort space. Uh, and so it's making it much more important that each individual case is is more highly vetted, that, every, that the lawyers know their cases and aren't just kind of stockpiling them. Um, and then the balance of that is we've also seen a surge in the volume of cases being filed. Um, and so, you know, where Depew was a pretty large MDL, HRT was a pretty large MDL in the fourteen to 15,000 plaintiff range. Yeah. Now we're seeing hundreds of thousands. Um, and so you're seeing an increased volume of claimants along with an increased burden on each one. Um, now, I do think some of that is, and I've talked with folks that we're our own worst enemies sometimes on the plaintiff side. Um, because of the rise of the volume, there are, there are unfortunately lawyers who are, not the ones in leadership necessarily, but the ones who bring in cases and don't work them. Um, and that's giving credence to defense claims that there are all these meritor- these meritless cases yeah. um, and very few meritorious cases. And so the courts are buying that, issuing these orders. Um, so it, it's become that much harder. And I speak specifically about, I should say, the device and, and drug litigations. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what we're seeing. And I think as a result, you're also seeing reduced cases um, being like reduced cases being brought in that sphere and more of a shift to seeing more of the toxic tort environment exposure uh, mass actions. Um, and part of that is because the science is catching up to allow us to, to pursue those, but um, it's, it's a different world um, and it's different for both the claimants and the firms who are trying to bring the cases. It's a different world than it was maybe a decade ago. And it's mm-hmm. definitely a different world than it is in other more traditional forms yes. of civil litigation, like single event yes. um, litigation. What would you say are some of the more stories that you can take um, from being involved in, in the master space as much as you have? Yeah, um, so one of my one of my favorite ones is, is less of a war story, more of a full circle. Um, I was working on some of the trial teams for the testosterone replacement litigation. And for one of our trials, opposing counsel was my former team that I had been a paralegal for. Um, so the lawyers, the lawyers trying the case had been my lawyers. I worked with, you know, the associates I'd worked under were now partners. Um, and it helped us because my old boss was still leading their trial, um, team for paralegals to work up. So I was able to get kind of, we had parted on good ways and, uh, we, I got kind of a back channel to smooth out some of the like logistical things like exhibit lists and things that can be fraught with just little snipey things. It was much smoother because of that connect, but that was a funny full circle moment. Um, I mean, yeah, I feel like everybody knows each other in the space too. Yes. Yes. A lot of people are familiar with the Kirkland Ellis attorneys and yep. It's a small world in a big world. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I mean, it touches the entire country. I always say that mass tort, you know, there might be a couple hundred attorneys that really, you know, run this, this show and, and we're, and it's on behalf of 300 million Americans. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the other side, there's how many defense attorneys? You know? Right. Maybe they have a little bit. Of- there's a little more. And I and I, I think part of it, too, is there's more of an impetus on the defense side to bring in associates and bring people in to, on the defense side, they have to get, it's all about billing, right? And their clients are not going to pay partner rates for every aspect of the work. 
um, it's much harder on the plaintiff side um, because you this is a very complex world to be in and you need a lot of substantive knowledge to move into those leadership spaces. Um, but because of the, the nature of plaintiff's firms where we are not, you know, we tend to be smaller, we tend to be leaner, there is not the same bottom up staffing. Uh, and so it can be, it's a lot harder to get experience for young attorneys in the space. Um, I was really fortunate at the firm I was at because Michelle really did prioritize bringing me in. I was second chairing her at my second or my first month, actually, at the firm I was second chairing her um, on ASR depositions and getting to see a regulatory octopus and work with them. Um, but that's not always the case. And so to your point, there's a small group and I think there's a lot of efforts happening now to try to expand that. Um, one of my the big areas I work in outside the tax side is uh, diversity and inclusion efforts. Um, and I think there are there's much more of a focus on that um, in our space, but it's hard because you can't rush the process either. You can't put someone in a position where they're not uh, ready for because you're just setting up for failure. Uh, and it actually becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy for the naysayers when you do that, right? Um, so I, I like seeing the progress where we're trying to get substantive work to younger attorneys, regardless of who their mentor is, um, to bring in solo practitioners, um, new firms, particularly women-led and, and uh, minority-led firms that are offshoots of bigger places, start, folks starting their own firms that need a different route into the experience of leadership. Um, so it, that that's actually been another change that I think is for the better, the recognition that we need um, need more voices and a broad breadth of experience. Um, but it's tough. You know, I split my time with single event and mass torts these days because I want to have trials and I need, and it's something that you don't get to be uh, on trial team at council table taking witnesses until you're 20 some years into your experience practically on the mass tort side. So um, it's definitely a, it's a stark contrast at times, the mass tort and single event practices. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's a totally different world, and and like I said, and 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 you mentioned this, you know, there's a select group of people, and it all it almost rewards them for doing more so the business side of mass sports rather than like the trial mm -hmm. aspects of it. And I and I know that there's advantages to that to the mass tort um, litigation as a whole. Yeah, that specific one in question, but. You know, we need to prioritize more and hopefully technology and AI is the way we do that. Prioritize more touches, more contact with claimants, vetting claimants, yeah. and, and ultimately, you know, doing what's in their best interest. Yeah, 100%. And I think that's, you're you're seeing both the advantage and disadvantage of mass tours, right? Because the advantage is by pooling our resources, you can bring in the top lawyers from across the country. Um, to work cases. You can pull the resources so economically we can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Goliaths of the world. Um, but as you noted, there's, you know, there's all these competing interests that can be really difficult to balance. And um, I think necessarily these moves by the defense bar to challenge individual cases is requiring those additional touches um, and the vetting. And, uh, you know, the other problem is with the proliferation of, you um, just number and volume, you're seeing more dual representation issues where multiple firms are have the same client because maybe the first firm is not staying in contact with their with their client and they don't know they have a lawyer still or they're dissatisfied. Um, and so you also, from the business side of the law firm, you need to have those touches so you keep your clients <laughs> and you don't lose them and or you don't end up sharing your fee because uh, now they've got three other lawyers somehow signed up after you took them on. And it's not to say that there's not claimants out there we just need to vet them actually yes. there's there's a there's a crisis in terms of access to civil justice what i think we only we only capture a small percentage of the individuals who are actually injured by some of these devices yeah and and environmental exposures and i think technology and some companies in the space are trying to increase um the capturing of of claimants across the country yeah but that's you know that's also not to say that the claimants that are in these litigations need to be vetted a little bit more responsibly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just want to transition really quick to the tech because we, yes. this is AI podcast. <laughs> yes. Yes. We can talk math towards all day. Um, you know, the overall theme of this podcast is AI, as you know, and I wanted to ask you what you think, in your opinion, how important is AI to the field of math towards? Correct. 
I think it is extremely important, but needs to be used with caution. Um, so I am someone who is a enthusiastic supporter, as long as everyone is using it um, with knowledge and with the proper guardrails. And I think the problem is you're seeing folks at the at two ends of the spectrum when it comes to AI. The naysayers who won't utilize it for anything because they're too worried about what it is and what it means and how it's it is the harbinger of destruction for the profession, right? Um, and the other side of, is are the folks who are very enthusiastic endorsers, um, but are counting on it for too much. And I think we've all seen the the problem stories of the news of folks put letting AI do their briefing and having it, those elucidated cases uh, be cited. So I think you need to move towards the middle there. And I, but with mass torts in particular, even more than the single events, AI is especially important when you start talking about needing to do processes at a volume. Um, and so as long as you, you use the right tools in the right ways, it can be really a game changer, not just in efficiency, but in the quality of the mass tort litigations we put forth. Um, and I think there's angles both for the leadership, what we're doing as a whole, um, and for the individual firms uh, managing their own roster of cases. So I think it's critical and I think it is, um, it, it's a shame for the folks who are completely closed off to that idea. Um, because I think you're not only disadvantaging yourself and your clients, um, you're going to get yourself stuck in the, in the past and you're not going to be able to progress in the way that the rest of the profession is. Yep. Yep. But in terms of data and data analyses, yeah. do you think that plays an important role in how we improve access to civil justice and how we vet cases? 100%. So data and data analysis is kind of my bag. Um, it's, it's where I got started on the mass tort side, aside from the litigation stuff. My firm has always been um, in the background being the ones processing PFS, scrape, PFS is scraping the data, helping with some negotiations and knowing what the actual census is. Um, and so the, the data of who our clients are um, is infinitely important at every aspect of mass tort litigation. So from the very beginning, when you are setting up the, um, knowing who your likely plaintiffs are as you're setting up these processes, is important. And then as you go through it and you're establishing your bellwether processes, your pools, you're figuring out who's actually representative of the claimants we're talking about. Um, and if you're fortunate enough to move into a space with, with resolution discussions with defendants, being able to um, have good, clean data that is backed up um, is extremely important. And what we're seeing now, actually, in the data analysis that is newer and being important is on those show cause processes where, um, you know, defendants are making arguments to the court at large. Oh, these are all just so badly done. There are so many cases that are don't have this, don't have this. Um, on the leadership side, if we can come back and say, actually, no, we have a process in place that we, have, you know, we know from the medical records, this percent has supported proof of use. This has supported product ID. Um, and to give us arguments that are not just conceptual and overview, but are data-driven specific arguments, um, that, that's always going to help us. And I think it's becoming much more important in keeping the cases alive and quite frankly, staying on the good side with the courts. Um, you know, it, I don't think it's an accent that we're seeing more and more of the judges skeptical as we're seeing these increased volumes and with it, the increased probably meritless cases that judges are becoming increasingly skeptical of our inventories of cases or our, our body of clients. Um, and so being able to come to the court and show that we are being rigorous, that we're looking at the data um, and say, judge, here's what we actually have. Here's, here's who's in this case. Here's what they're proving up. Yes, there's always going to be outliers, but at the core, we still have these injured plaintiffs who are following the rules doing X, Y, and Z. Um, so, you know, not to steal the corny phrase, but now more than ever, it's extremely important. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Um, going into, you know, what people might associate with traditional forms of AI platforms yes. for, for legal services, platforms that help for research and discovery and briefings. Do you, and do you currently use any of those platforms? Yes, I use, I use platforms in a couple different places. So um, we use some for our background um, in terms of medical chronologies. We, we have human aspects to it, including empty review, but we have the first cut being chronologies being built 
um, by the uh, by the AI. Um, and this is in my particular practice, and I'll talk about what I've we've I've worked with others to implement in Mass Tort too. Um, we I we actually just this week kind of started using Lexis AI on the legal research side of things um, to see how we're playing around with that to see if we like it. Um, Lexis had the Stanford study. I don't know if you saw that on the AI. Lexis had a much lower hallucination rate <laughs> than Westlaw did, so that's why I ultimately went with Lexis. Um, but it's a good reminder that you know, the way you use the tool is important. So we don't use that to say, write us this brief. It's, hey, start pointing us to some cases. We have to actually read the cases and make sure they say what they say, what they proclaim they say, um, and use it to a kind of a hunting tool, not to give us the initial answer or the actual ultimate answer. Um, yeah. And one thing I've actually really liked using some generative AI for has been helping with articulations of things. Whether it, so one of the things I found I would get stuck on the most, say I'm doing a deposition script and I have like a particular rule and needs to be worded exactly right to get the defendant to agree to because they can't do anything else. And if I'm stuck on the wording, I'll use generative AI. Um, there's a couple of different platforms I've been using for, I'll say different ways to articulate and I'll so I point in and I'll get like a list of 10 different ways to say it and I can cobble it together. And that's been my favorite use of AI actually on the generative side is just getting past the, um, the, the writer's block. Uh, I'm not going to use it whole cloth, but it gets me past that moment. So um, those, those are the ones we're using in my firm specifically. Um, on the mass tort side, I'm working with a litigation that has uh, over 20,000 uh, filed cases. Uh, and we are exploring and I, I'm helping manage the census process there, which is a voluntary census in that case. Um, and we're exploring different ways to use um, technology that can uh, pull, can scrape from medical records to give us census data so that we have good armed information about um, who our claimants are, what's backed up by the records. Uh, so that process, we're still looking at a couple different angles of it. So I don't want to get too much of the detail on what case it is and, yeah. and, and what process we're using there. Um, but the idea of removing the initial burden of human eyes because of the obviously we're all you know we human error is a real thing um but also just the time it's much easier to have a human that spot check and say okay this is what you pulled out yes i see that exists on those pages we're good to go versus having someone hunt for and find everything and then document it because really the ai shortcut of documenting things for you is huge um, I also will do, um, like on Zoom, depending on the meeting, if it's not confidential, I'll use the AI assistant just to help take notes coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And that's really helpful because it makes, you know, I know that if I miss something talking to people, then it's going to be captured. Uh, so I think there's different ways in all aspects of, that I'm bringing in AI. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you mentioned your use in personal injury for the writer's block mm -hmm. example that you provided. Like there's many ways we can be creative about using AI platforms. It doesn't have to just be traditional. I want it to do my job. Right. Like find ways. There's platforms out there that you can utilize to improve, improve your practice. Yes. Um, I will say that, you know, I don't know if you saw this, but open AI mm -hmm. only a few days ago unveiled um, their new agent platform mm -hmm. where you can say, you know, I want a pizza and this AI agent will actually go out call a, a local pizza joint yeah. order for you using your card and have something delivered to you. And that brings up the question of agency and, and delegating duties to yeah. AI platforms as, as much as we think it's, it's, it's far into the future and might not affect us currently. I think it's coming quicker than, than we imagine. So yes, I want to ask you, do you ever see yourself delegating some of your work to an AI program? Uh, not on my substantive work. Um, you know, if you ask my staff, I, one of my problems is I have to be very, uh, I can be pushed pretty hard to delegate. I like to do things with myself a little, a little too much when it comes to tasks. Um, but besides that, I, my general approach to AI is to think of it as a, think of it like a paralegal or an associate, someone who can do some of the steps for you, but ultimately you still need to be responsible for reviewing and overseeing the final product. Um, and so that's kind of the metric I use when I think about any kind of delegation or task to AI. Um, you know, that's why I'm not going to, 
even my associates write big briefs for me, I'm still reading it at the end of the day and checking the cases to make sure, you know, they're, they're saying what they need to say. That's how I approach the AI. And I think it's funny that the open AI thing is such a big deal. Uh, a lot of people don't know Google's had something similar for a number of years. Um, if you've ever seen when you pull up a, a place, yeah, they've had this Google reservation agent. Um, so if you Google a restaurant, it will say like, make a reservation. And sometimes it's not because there's an, it's not like open table or one of the platforms. Google had an AI that would call the restaurant and actually talk through the scheduling and get a reservation for it. And I used it, I've used it a couple of times. Um, and it's been at least three years that, that it's been at play. And I've talked to people who've been on the receiving end of the calls and it sounds like a person. Like they have the same, like, oh, well, how, you know, it's this many people. Well, how about this time? But that doesn't work. And it would negotiate like reservation times. So that is the kind of thing that, yes, I would delegate or booking, you know, booking conference rooms for a deposition or prep. And that's the kind of thing I can see delegating um, where, you know, you just have a human at the end of the day confirm that the booking's in place, but doesn't a person doesn't need to actually be on the phone waiting on hold and going through that. That kind of task I would, um, you know, into more advanced. Enough. Yeah. More marketing has towards. Exactly. No, no, on that, I, I still, even when we have, are using the mass tort, excuse me, the AI in the mass tort space, I still have my staff and my folks checking it and, and making sure things are accurate. So I think that is my number, my two, I have two tips for anyone getting into AI. First, yeah. don't upload client documents or sensitive things. They're, they're not secure. Don't, just don't do it. I mean, some people are a little more advanced in their knowledge of it, and, and but overall, just say, don't don't upload medical records or sensitive documentation and to any of these systems. Um, and the second one is have human eyes check the work product. If you're pulling cases for legal research, make sure someone is checking that the cases say what they say they are and that they exist. <laughs> um, you know, if it's if it's writing something, have make sure someone's actually reading it for accuracy because AI can do a little bit of a word salad where the words look good at first glance, but when you actually piece it together, um, it doesn't make sense. It's kind of like that person everyone's annoyed by who just uses big words that doesn't mean anything when they're talking. <laughs> AI is kind of like that person. You need to actually make sure it's the words make sense together. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. And, 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 and yeah, I mean, to your point about sensitive information uploads. Yeah. I think in all of these AI platforms, even the ones we think of as more secure, there's, there's third party platforms that actually plug yeah. in, let's say chat GBT into their system. They make it look like a, a separate system. Then whatever you put in input or upload yeah. is, is being utilized them and commercialized. Yeah. Uh, monetized. And, and, but I guess I would say the same thing is happening with chat GPT. Yes. As well. Yes. In any platform. Yeah. So, so keep be careful, but yeah. And I think that actually raises one of the biggest problems that people aren't really thinking about with AI, which is as we use AI more, what what is the system getting trained off of? Um, and so the biggest risk is as people are uploading things or feeding back in, it, as AI is capturing content that was created by AI, we're now introducing higher and higher levels of margins of inaccuracy and margins of error there because the system and in its early stages, it's trained off of human knowledge, right? It's uh, the early systems are, are crawling and grabbing documents written by humans. But as more documents are being written by AI and maybe not being credited as AI, that's becoming the foundation for the answers of the knowledge. And so it's kind of, it, it, it's making it so there's less of, of reality um, to the basis of these answers. So it's one of the things that when I'm vetting new systems, one of the big things I ask about is aside from what, what large language model they're using, what are, what are they training off of? Is it, a, is it a closed circle where my prompts and my responses are kept out of training or is it being fed into? And I don't like to use systems where it's being trained off of the results because it can introduce that larger uh, risk of error. So, I'm so glad you brought that up, uh, Kara, because they say that exponentially what's available on the internet will be AI sourced. Yeah. To the point where by 2040, the vast majority of content on the internet is actually produced by AI. So, yeah. And so it's almost like we're full circle. Yeah. It's just you just, yeah. I don't know. It feels like that's how you get Skynet. Like, <laughs> like you want Skynet. That's how you get Skynet. <laughs> I think what also is interesting really quick before we wrap up is 
I think that it almost seems to me that there needs to be some sort of trade-off because these AI systems, as they get more powerful, um, lawyers will want to use them. And that comes with the cost of um, forking over sensitive data to, yeah. to some of these tech platforms. And what is that? What does that look like for claimants at, at intake? Mm-hmm. Our, our claimants have to sign a consent form that says, you know, as your attorney, I'm going to use some tech platforms to advance your cause. And the trade-off might be that, you know, now you have targeted ads from yeah. medical device companies or companies trying to, to, to market at you. So yeah, I think it's going to be interesting how um, mass torts, personal injury as a whole evolves, the legal field as a whole evolves. But, you know, I just want to say before we wrap up, I want you to just provide one thing to our viewers that you, you'd want them to know um, before, before we close. Oh, that's a big ask. Um, I would say the one thing I want folks to know is technology is not the enemy. It is your friend, but you have to approach it like you would a uh, wild animal that is still kind of in a zoo where it's still a wild animal. You still have to take, have your precautions uh, but it's not something that you need to run from because there's still barriers in place. So that's kind of an imperfect analogy, but the takeaway would just be, don't be afraid of tech. <laughs> Ask anyone and I have terrible analogies, but no, tech is your friends and it can make our jobs better and it can, it really can increase our service to our clients. But to your point, um, you need to have open dialogue to the clients too, so they know. Um, my clients actually sign different um, consent forms for some of the programs we're using. They're not necessarily AI, but vendor tools that are a little bit more invasive. My client signed consent forms so they know what's going on. So, of course, of course. but using tech is yeah. way to, is the future and uh, it doesn't make any sense to put your head in the sand. Yep, yep. Well, Kara, thank you for coming on. As yes. I mentioned, I truly believe you're one of the most prominent mass court attorneys in the space thank you. and will continue to grow as an attorney and, and you know, being as tech forward as you are, it, I really appreciate you coming. Yeah. Well, thanks for the space, Rock. It's always a pleasure and uh, appreciate having a chance to talk with you. Yep, yep. We'll talk soon. All right, thanks. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for tuning into the Law, AI, and Money podcast. If you enjoyed our conversation, be sure to like and subscribe so we can keep the conversation going. Thank you.